On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including Elon Musk surprises us with news about the next generation of Raptor engine, Vast partners with SpaceX to get the first commercial space station in orbit by 2025, and Rocket Lab is proving themselves while planning for the future. This is The Space Race. On May 12th, the crew at NASA Spaceflight, who have been documenting the SpaceX rocket development facility in McGregor, Texas, caught this view of a Raptor engine being fired three times in quick succession. They had no idea that they had just captured one of the first test fires of the new Raptor V3 engine. Less than 14 hours later, CEO Elon Musk posted his congratulations to the team, which was the first announcement that they had been designing this new engine at all, but what's really staggering are the stats. In his first post, Elon showed off a graph of the pressure output over time. For the 1 minute and 13 seconds the V3 was firing, it was able to hold a chamber pressure of about 350 bar, or 5,000 PSI, and generated 269 tons of thrust. For comparison, the V2 engines have 230 tons of thrust and about 300 bars of pressure with the capability of being tuned to 250 tons of thrust. This means that while the current loadout of 33 Raptor V2 engines can give the Super Heavy Booster a maximum of 7,590 tons of force, SpaceX could use this new V3 engine to achieve 8,877 tons at max thrust. This is such an insane amount of power that Elon didn't expect the engine to survive the full burn duration, saying it's uncharted territory. He followed that up with a flex of his new engine, writing, Raptor chamber wall might have the highest heat flux of anything ever made. No kidding, SpaceX was having trouble keeping the V2s from shaking apart at full thrust, and they haven't reached their full potential. The V3s might hold up to the test at hand, but what's going to happen when they're put into an array? At this time, there isn't any more data than what Elon just posted, but thanks to the Starship test flight on April 20th, we do know some things about Starship. While many conventional rockets couldn't possibly hold up to the strain of almost 9,000 tons of thrust force, Starship is not a conventional rocket. It held its structural integrity through spinning four loops and the activation of its flight termination system. So we don't imagine that even these V3 engines could shake the booster apart. Adding this much extra thrust allows a rocket as tough as Starship is to haul more into space, more fuel and more payload weight especially if SpaceX can manage to get some refueling stations into orbit like they are planning to do. I don't know which SpaceX engineer looked at Super Heavy and thought it was a tad underpowered, but that's certainly not going to be a problem for much longer, and it leads to the thought that SpaceX likely has plans for Starship's payload capabilities that needed a more powerful engine than the Raptor V2. Regardless, we are going to have to wait to see more concrete data on this new engine before making any more conclusions. It will be interesting to see if SpaceX starts fitting test boosters with this new engine soon. On May 10th, a surprise announcement from launch services startup Vast revealed that the relatively unknown company had signed a deal with SpaceX to develop, build, and launch their own space station by 2025, years before any other company can be ready. If the plan works, Haven 1 will be the first commercial space station in orbit, beating every other established company by at least two years. Axiom is planning on launching their first module by 2024, but it's going to be tied to the International Space Station until the late 2020s. NanoRack Starlab could be operational by 2027, Blue Origin's Orbital Reef and Northrop Grumman's unnamed station both don't have a set launch date yet. The field seems wide open for Haven 1. The station is planned to be launched on a Falcon 9 rocket and will consist of just a single capsule-like module capable of supporting a four-person crew for about 30 days. That is a fairly short duration, but by partnering with SpaceX, Vast has scored a stable support provider who can launch multiple missions per month with no issues. And while the station will be very small at the beginning, Vast is planning on making Haven 1 much more, well, vast. Haven 1's primary function is to serve as a testbed for orbital concepts like zero-g manufacturing and artificial gravity. 
You know those depictions of rotating stations in every sci-fi movie? That's what they're going for. In the beginning, Vast intends to build out Haven 1 into a 100 meter long stick station which will rotate about its axis like a log spinning in a river. But once the tech has proven stable, they are going to expand into those iconic wheel shapes we've seen in movies like The Martian, using SpaceX's new heavy lift Starship rocket to get the larger modules into orbit. Rotation like this can be used to simulate gravity using rotational forces. The faster the station spins, the stronger the simulated gravity. VAST plans to start by trying to simulate the moon's weaker pull about one-sixth that of Earth's to see if the station hardware can take the strain. And if that is successful, they'll continue to test. Well-made plans aside though, where did VAST come from? Most of us haven't heard of the company before now, and it's certainly very new being formed in 2021 by cryptocurrency billionaire Jed McCaleb. So how did this company go from almost complete obscurity to landing a deal with SpaceX to beat out contenders like Northrop Grumman, Blue Origin, and Axiom? Well, it seems like it's mostly down to the money that founder Jed McCaleb brought to the table. McCaleb has served as an executive on a couple of companies and even created a few himself, so he's always been well off, and it looks like he used that leg up to invest in the early crypto boom, which earned him an estimated worth of about $2.4 billion. This is important because, just like with Elon Musk, Jeb has used his riches to hire a stellar engineering team for Vast, and has already acquired another company called Launch to supplement Vast with orbital tugs, which will be key to positioning Haven 1. McCaleb has a very similar philosophy about the importance of space travel as Musk does, so it's not surprising to see Vast using some of SpaceX's playbook here. In fact, some of that stellar engineering team even comes from SpaceX. Some big SpaceX alumni count themselves among Vast's team now, meaning that there's a lot of interplay between the two companies. Former SpaceX Vice President Hans Koenigsmann is even advising McCaleb, and this is likely why the two companies decided to partner. The benefits for both companies are obvious. Vast gets a reliable launch provider with industry-leading technology, and SpaceX gets to manage their own space station right down to vetting and training any crew members, commercial ticket buyers included. But there are other, more established companies out there that SpaceX could have reached out to. They are the biggest name in commercial space work right now, and could likely make a deal with just about everyone. But looking at the roster of former SpaceX engineers working at Vast, it's hard not to see them as one big company. Sharing ideals and engineering talent does make planning a whole lot easier. Time will tell if Vast can hold to its 2025 schedule. Reports are that the company is beginning construction of the module as we speak, and given the independent nature of its mission, Vast won't have to jump through extra safety hoops like Axiom Space does with NASA's regulations. Axiom was the company with the earliest launch date for their station, but it will be attached to the International Space Station until the old platform reaches its end of service date later this decade. Vast won't have those hurdles, so even if they do end up pushing their launch by a year or so, they should still be the first ever commercial station. Fingers crossed. Launch provider Rocket Lab had its annual earnings call on May 16th, where the company's leadership announced that they are aiming for at least 15 launches with their Electron rocket system this year and 20 launches in 2024. The smaller company has become a rising star in the US market over the last two years, and though the gap is quite large, Rocket Lab is second only to SpaceX in terms of contracts held. NASA has even begun handing Rocket Lab contracts from other companies who have either failed to deliver or have taken too long to launch. One of these is the Starling mission, a swarm of four CubeSats that NASA intends to use to test future mission technology. Firefly was due to launch this mission on their Alpha rocket, but they haven't flown since October 2022, when Alpha failed to put its payload into a high enough orbit. Just last week, on May 7th, Rocket Lab successfully launched two of NASA's Tropic Storm Tracking CubeSats, a mission Rocket Lab took from Astra when the company failed to get the job done back in June of last year. So it seems that Rocket Lab is gaining a reputation for picking up after more experimental teams drop the ball, which is certainly a niche with job security. The new space race is filled with new takes on launch technology, so there's going to be lots of misses and failures. 
That doesn't mean these companies should stop. Both Astra and Firefly are continuing to develop new rockets and try new missions. Firefly specifically is due to attempt another alpha launch sometime this month for the US Space Force, so they're hardly out of the running yet. But the reliability of Rocket Lab's Electron has obviously grabbed the attention of big US contract providers, and it's led to some solid funding and unique opportunities for the company. During the earnings call, Rocket Lab's executives announced that the company has already made over $19 billion this year and expects to top that in the next quarter with the integration of updated reusability tech for their Electron rocket. Rocket Lab is in a very good place right now. They have a solid reputation and plenty of new contracts coming in. The suborbital hypersonic haste project alone will bring in a lot of work for the company from the US Defense Department. They are testing hypersonic infrastructure, launching extreme weather warning satellites, and test payloads for future NASA missions, all while developing their own fully reusable neutron rocket. This company is becoming unstoppable. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.